Greetings and welcome to lecture number 27 on basic circuit theory. I am Beza Razavi. Today we will uh, look at one more example of uh, driven RL circuits uh, just to see how we write equations and uh, how we solve these circuits. And then uh, we will uh, provide a detailed summary of uh, the properties that we have seen for resistors and capacitors and inductors so far in this course so that everything comes under the same roof and we have a better understanding of how all of these relate to each other. And with that, we are then ready to jump into RLC circuits and see that uh, when combining these devices, we actually obtain much more interesting circuits and much more interesting responses. But before we go there, let's uh, take a look at uh, what we covered last time. Uh, we talked about driven RL circuits, uh, starting with the simple example of a parallel combination of a resistor and an inductor driven by a current step, a current that jumps from 0 to I1 at time 0. And wanted to study various parameters in the circuit, so for example, the current flowing through the inductor I out. And we saw that uh, initially, because L1 has no current, its current cannot jump, so if it's zero before zero, it has to stay zero for a little while, and then it takes off and approaches its final value. The final value happens at time infinity, and at that time, because this current is constant, the voltage across the inductor is zero, the voltage across the resistor is zero, the current through the resistor is zero, which means all of this current flows through the inductor. That's how we obtain the final current to be I1. And the time constant was given by the inductance divided by the resistance. All right, and then we also looked at this type of uh, driven RL circuit uh, where we have all of these devices in series. This is a voltage source that jumps from zero to V1 at time zero. Now we saw that, again, if you're interested in this current, I out, we see that the current uh, initially is zero because L1 doesn't want its, its current to change instantaneously, so it follows an exponential behavior again. And the final value of the current is obtained by noting that at time infinity, this current is constant, this voltage is zero, so the current through R1, which happens to be the current through the inductor, is equal to this voltage minus this voltage divided by R1, so that's V1 over R1. And then uh, also interesting was actually the voltage across this inductor, and we saw that when this voltage jumps, this voltage also jumps immediately, as you can see here. And why is that? Well, because if the inductor has a zero current at time zero minus, it wants to retain that zero current at a zero plus. That means that this inductor momentarily acts as an open circuit. It doesn't want to have any current. So if it doesn't have any current, we have no current through R1, which means the voltage drop across R1 is zero, which means this voltage is equal to this voltage. So the voltage across the inductor just follows the voltage applied at the input, and then it begins to go down, as we saw before, and exponentially decays. All right, so now let's go to another driven RLC, RL circuit that is a little more interesting. So. <clears throat> We look at this example here. So suppose I have a battery V1. I have a resistor R1. And I have an inductor L1. Okay. And we let the circuit sit for a long time. So everything is stabilized. We know that if there is any current, that current has become constant, which means the voltage across the inductor is zero. If the voltage is zero, then the current through R1 is just this voltage minus zero over R1 divided, uh, that gives us the current, and that current flows through this entire loop. All right, so now let's go and do something different. We will add another resistor here, R2, and we will switch this resistor into the circuit at time zero. So at time zero, this switch closes or it begins to conduct. 
So at t equals 0. All right, then we'd like to see exactly what happens when this, the circuit topology changes. The circuit consisted of a voltage source R1 and L1 in series, but now suddenly we came along and added one more resistor in parallel to R1. So the question is, well, does the circuit do something different now? Because the resistance has changed from R1 to R1, R2 over R1 plus R2. All right? Okay, so for example, let's look at this current here. Let's say this is the quantity of interest to us. And we want to see how I R out changes as a function of time. All right, so what's the first thing we do? Not panic, right? We just sit down, think about the circuit carefully, and uh, write down everything that we understand about the circuit, right? Okay, so the first thing is, uh, let's figure out I out at time zero minus. So I out at zero minus. So that's before the switch comes to the picture, before this is in the picture. So we know that that current is just V1 over R1, as we saw before. So that's V1 over R1. This is assuming that this circuit consisting of V1, R1, and L1 had been sitting there for a long time, so all the transients have decayed and died away. Okay, now, uh, what can I say about I out at time zero plus? It's the same thing. The current through the inductor cannot change in zero time because we don't have any infinite voltage available anywhere. So that also has to be the same. So it's V1 over R1. All right. How about I out at time infinity? Can we calculate that? So let's see what we can do. So I out of infinity. Well, you can visualize what's happening here, right? At infinity, again, everything has stabilized. All the voltages and currents are constant. But the circuit now consists of V1 in series with the parallel combination of these two, and then in series with L1. So I can write the current right away, right? I can say that this current is equal to this voltage, V1, minus this voltage, 0, because this inductor acts as a short circuit at time infinity because its current has become constant, divided by this resistance, right? This voltage minus this voltage divided by this resistance. So the current at time infinity is V1 over R1 in parallel with R2. All right, so this reasoning exactly follows this reasoning, right? Same thing, except that the value of the resistor has changed. Uh, both of them have settled, no transients exist, but the values of the resistors are different. Okay, so uh, the system is of first order because we have only a single inductor. So if you find a time constant, then we can use our general equation for first order systems with a constant input or a step input, right? So how much is the time constant? So we say for t greater than zero, the time constant is the inductance divided by the resistance that that inductor sees. And for that, we would have to set the independent sources to zero. This becomes a short circuit. And we see that this inductor now sees these two in parallel. If you simplify it, I can uh, draw, draw it like this, so R2, R1, and L1, right? So if you consider these two points as the connection of L1 to the rest of the circuit, our procedure says set the independent sources to zero. When I set this to zero, I get this. Take the inductor out, I take it out, and I sit here and I find the resistance that the inductor would see, so that's just R1 in parallel with R2. Okay, so now we can write I out as a function of time, right? So I out of T is equal to the value at infinity, this value here, V1 over R1 in parallel with R2, plus the value at time zero, plus, which is V1 over R1, 
minus the value at infinity, R1 over R parallel R2, then X above minus T over tau. Does this take a U of T? No, because the current through the inductor was not a zero before time zero. So we just have to write T greater than zero here. Uh, that's all we can say for this equation. So we can quickly sketch the current just to get, get a feel for what's going on. So I out as a function of time. So before time zero, uh, we had only V1, R1, and L1. So this current was given by V1 over R1. So before time zero, the current was here. It was V1 over R1. And after time zero, it stayed at that value briefly, and then it began to, this, uh, to increase. Why does it increase? Uh, because why, why is this value greater than this value? Well, because the resistance has decreased, right? You place two resistors in parallel uh, between the inductor and the battery. So now we have more current flowing through the in inductor. So this current increases to a final value of, uh, okay, let me clean this up here. I have to draw this a little lower so that it's all nice and clear. So we start out at a value of V1 over R1. And then this grows towards the final value. The final value is given by this one. So V1 over R1 in parallel with R2. All right, so that's the behavior of I out. Okay, can I find uh, V out, for example? Can I call the voltage across the inductor V out? So let's call this voltage the voltage difference between these two points V out, and ask uh, how much is V out, right? Okay, so we can uh, find V out by using this equation, the inductance times the derivative of the current. So let's try to do that. So we say uh, V out of T is equal to L1, the inductance, times the derivative of the current with respect to time. So derivative of this is zero. We have this, uh, the constant times the derivative of this. So that will give us minus one over tau. And then we have a V1 over R1 minus V1 over R1 in parallel with R2. And then we have X of a minus T over tau. So minus T over tau. Does this take a U of T? Yes, because the voltage across this inductor was zero before time zero, right? And after time zero, it started changing, but before time zero, it was zero. Why was it zero? Well, before time zero, when this switch was not in the picture, this circuit had reached the steady state, meaning all the values had reached a constant value. So the current was constant, the voltage was zero from this equation, so yes, V out was zero. So yes, this indeed takes a U of T here. And you can also see that if I take the derivative of this function, here the derivative is zero, right? So we have zero and then we have the derivative of this, so yes, it's, it's a, it is multiplied by U of T. So uh, for completeness, we can also sketch V out as a function of time here. Uh, so that is all nice and clear. So the derivative of this function is zero before time zero. And the derivative jumps, right? The slope here jumps from zero to some value. And you can see that here too, because at time zero, this is a one, and uh, this value is actually a positive value. Why is the positive value? Because I have a negative value here, and this term in magnitude is greater than this term, right? This is a smaller number in the denominator. So this whole thing is positive. So V out jumps to a positive value, like so, which is this whole thing here, uh, well, multiplied by L1, and then it decays to zero. Uh, 
Okay, so that's the output voltage. So as soon as this switch turns on and this resistor is introduced in the circuit, this voltage jumps from zero to some amount, but then it goes back to zero when all the currents stabilize. Okay, so that was the last example for a driven RL circuit. And let's now go and summarize everything that we have learned about these devices so that we can clearly, clearly see the roles. So we have seen resistors and uh, capacitors and inductors. Okay. So the, the basic equations governing these are for resistors we have Ohm's law. For capacitors we have I equals C D V over D T. For inductors we have V is equal to L D I over D T. And of course you can write these in integral form also, it doesn't matter, but uh, we have these three equations. Alright, so that's the a basic relationship between the current and the voltage of each device. Uh, so here we have derivatives and integrals, here we don't. Here a change in the current immediately results in a change in the voltage, but here that's not necessarily true. So there are also sort of interesting things going on here. Okay, uh, then uh, the energy uh, stored, so we say basic equation for this one then we have energy stored well we know that resistors cannot store energy they can dissipate it right so we don't have any storage uh, in here the energy stored in a capacitor is one half cv squared in an inductor is one half li squared we can also see that the initial conditions that we attribute to these devices actually relate to their energy storage as well. You see that the energy, the initial condition of a capacitor is always specified by a voltage, not a current, and the energy associated with an inductor is always for the current, not for the voltage. And they are fundamentally related to the energy that we store in them. Okay. All right, so continuing our comparisons so we say initial conditions so we don't have initial conditions for resistors because they don't have any storage ability and then here is V0 here is I0 so that's all simple and nice uh, let's see what else we want to say here okay so what I call singularities, singular, singularities, means uh, things that end up with some infinite quantity somewhere. For resistors, we don't have that. But uh, for a capacitor, we end up with an infinite current if the voltage changes instantaneously, right? So we say I is infinite if V jumps. All right, those go hand in hand. If we want the voltage to jump, we have to provide an infinite current. And for an inductor, it's the other way around, so we say V is equal to infinite if I jumps. So again, if the circuit uh, must jump the current in zero time, then the circuit must be able to provide an infinite voltage across the inductor at that point in time. It's an impulse. So that impulse has to be available. And of course, in practice, we can't do that. We can just make approximations of these things. All right. Uh, then we saw some other important points that were essential for analyzing circuits that consist of capacitors and inductors. So those have to do with, uh, again, just the behavior of these when there's a switching event or when everything has settled. So let me try to summarize those as uh, shown, as I will show you in a moment so that we can understand. Okay, so let's, uh, I'll make some observations uh, below this table so that we 
have everything ready. Okay, let's change the color of our pen to green. Okay, so if we have a capacitor with a zero initial condition, so we say initial condition. So we have something like this, at t equals zero minus, all right? Then we know that at uh, t0 plus is the same thing. Right, we decided that if there's no infinite current, uh, the voltage on the capacitor cannot jump. So between, in this very short time interval, the voltage doesn't change. It's still zero. So uh, to simplify this, we say, because the capacitor wants to maintain a zero volt difference across it, it looks like a short circuit, right? That's what the short circuit does. So in this transition, as, going from, as we go from zero minus to zero plus, we can say that the capacitor is equivalent to a short. All right? Only for that very brief period of time. So this is how we simplify our analysis when we're trying to find uh, the values at time zero plus, given the values at time zero minus. Okay, so that's uh, one uh, idea or simple concept related to capacitors. Now let's make things a little more interesting and consider a slightly different situation. Suppose I have a capacitor and the initial condition on it is not zero, it's V zero. So that's still at time zero minus, all right? And then we go to time zero plus. Well, again, if there's no infinite current available, it's the same voltage, right, V zero. Okay, so how do I model this? I cannot model the capacitor by a short circuit because the short circuit has zero volts across it. This doesn't have zero volts across it. It has V zero, some volt, one volt, two volts, right? So how do I model this capacitor? How do I visualize this capacitor in this very short amount of time from zero minus to zero plus? Well, we could model it by a battery. A battery does that, exactly, right? So we change the color and we model it by a battery. So here's a battery. So we say the capacitor is equivalent, or let me erase this here. We say the capacitor is equivalent to a battery of value V0 in this short amount of time. So the capacitor is equivalent to a battery of value V0 between 0 minus and 0 plus. All right, so neither of these are essential when we're analyzing the circuit. You can still stay with the idea that the capacitor just wants to keep its voltage, whatever it is. But sometimes it's helpful if you say, okay, I'm going to replace the capacitor with a short circuit for this little analysis from zero minus to zero plus so that the circuit is easier to analyze, right? It is only for that time period from zero minus to zero plus. Okay, let's repeat all of these for inductors. So, for inductors, uh, let's change the color to maybe this one here. Okay, so I'll draw a little line. So I have an inductor, and uh, at time zero minus, the current through it is zero. So we say I equals zero. So I go to time zero plus, and I'm assuming that the circuit cannot have an infinite voltage available for the inductor. So at time zero plus, the current is still zero. Right? The current through the inductor cannot jump, 
if we don't have an infinite voltage available. Okay, so how can I model this inductor in this short time period? Well, so the inductor doesn't want to have any current. Its current is guaranteed to be zero for a very brief uh, period of time. So do we know any device that does that? Yes, a, an open circuit guarantees a zero current. So for this short period of time, I can say that the inductor is equivalent to an open. So if I have a complicated circuit and I see some switching events, something wants to change. There's a step, uh, there's a switch that turns on and off or something, and I want to see what happens from zero minus to zero plus. If I want to simplify the circuit, I will go ahead and replace this inductor with an open circuit, provided that the current through the inductor is zero at time zero minus. Okay, uh, how about uh, when we have a finite current to the inductor. Here the current, remember here the voltage was not zero, here the current may not be zero before at time zero minus. In fact, we had that example right here, remember? At zero minus the current was not zero. Okay, so let's uh, do that. So suppose that, uh, okay, to be consistent with my colors, I will switch back to that color here. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I have an inductor and its current is I0 at 0 minus. And what I know is that that current has to be I0 at 0 plus. So that's still I0 if no, no infinite voltage is available. So how can I model this? I have a device that wants to maintain a current of I0 for some amount of time, very brief amount of time. So, well, that would be a dual of what we saw here. We saw a voltage source here. Now we can model this by current source because this device wants to maintain that current during that short time interval. All right, so then we say that the inductor behaves as a current source for that brief period of time, that current source value is I0. All right, so these replacements that we can make for these devices come in handy if you are analyzing a complex circuit and there is a switching event somewhere. All right, so that's great. Okay, now um, these were all for switching events, so I'm going to uh, draw a line here and uh, separate these switching events, right? So these are all uh, switching events. Switching events means that uh, something is switching in the circuit or the step or the switch that turns turn on and off and right from zero minus zero plus we're curious to see what has changed, what has not changed. So during that time we can make these replacements to simplify the circuit and the analysis. All right, uh, yet another group of observations relates to when everything has settled. So we might call these final values or final state, final values. So in the steady state. So suppose that we have reached a point where nothing is changing, right? So we have something here uh, for the voltage or the current, something here, right? Nothing is changing. And we'd like to see how the circuit can be simplified in these cases. All right, so we say uh, values are constant. That means voltages and currents, right? Okay, so if uh, the values are constant, what can we say about the capacitors? So let's change the color back to green. We say a capacitor whose uh, voltage has reached a constant value. So we say V is constant. 
That means that uh, the current to the capacitor is zero. The current to the capacitor being zero means that the, the capacitor acts as an open circuit. That's the only device that can satisfy that condition. So we say that's equivalent to an open. All right. Okay, and for an inductor, what happens? For an inductor, we'll change the current to here. And we say, if you have an inductor, and we know that the current through it is constant, okay, then this equation says that if the current is constant, the voltage is zero. If the, the inductor wants to make its voltage zero, and the only device that can do that is a short circuit. So that would be equivalent to a short. All right, so all of these play a role when we are analyzing more complex circuits, especially when we get to RLC circuits, we have to remember all of these because then we have inductors and capacitors. We have the interplay between these devices. We just have to remember fundamentally we have all of these conditions. Of course, all of this entire set of observations assumes that we do not have infinite currents and infinite voltages available, right? If we do, then the story is different. Okay, so that's a quick summary of everything that we have learned so far. And we are now ready to go to RLC circuits. Let me make sure that I haven't uh, left out anything at this point. All right, okay, so let's go and start uh, looking at RLC circuits. Okay, so introduction to RLC circuits. All right. <clears throat> So what you might have observed is that as we introduce new devices and combine more devices uh, together, we end up with more interesting circuits. If you have only resistors and build circuits out of resistors, they're pretty boring, right? A bunch of resistors and voltage source or current source connected to each other, mm, sort of interesting, right? But once you have a resistor and a capacitor, the situation becomes more interesting. Once you have a resistor and inductor, it's also interesting. And so that we would expect that once we have resistors and capacitors and inductors in the same circuit, the situation becomes much more interesting and probably much more useful, much more representative of what happens in real life. So that's why we want to study RLC circuits in great detail. The foundation that we have built in the past 20 some lectures is necessary for analyzing RLC circuits and intuitively understand what they do. All right, so before uh, looking at an RLC circuit, I wanted to start with this little pendulum that I have here. Okay, I built this quickly in my lab. Uh, this is a pendulum, right? Now, you know from mechanics that you took in physics uh, that uh, this weight, this mass sitting here has no potential energy with respect to this plane. But if I lift it over here, now it has some potential energy, right? Because it's higher than here. Okay, so we have some potential energy here. And now we let go. What happens? So the potential energy that we have at this point uh, transforms itself to kinetic energy as this device accelerates and it reaches, for example, down here. So over here we have all potential energy. Over here, it has become all kinetic energy was going, right? It has some velocity. And then as it goes to the other extreme, that kinetic energy is uh, converted back to potential energy. So we have this uh, periodic behavior where we started out with a device. We gave it some perturbation and we let go. And that perturbation and this device, this system, results in this oscillatory behavior, a behavior that repeats itself indefinitely, right? So and this, in this uh, periodic behavior, we have the conversion of potential energy, to, uh, potential energy to kinetic energy to potential energy and so on, right? And it keeps going back and forth. Okay, so this is the mechanical analogy 
of what we will see in RLC circuits. Now, uh, just the way uh, this oscillation or this periodic behavior decays and the pendulum comes to a stop, we would expect we should see something similar in RLC circuits. Why does it stop? Well, because there's friction at the hinge up here, and there's also the air friction, right? So there's some, uh, there's some mechanism in the system that converts the energy that we gave to this guy, the, kinetic, the uh, potential energy that we gave it, converts that energy to heat, right? This hinge heats up, the air heats up as a result of friction with this weight. So we are losing the energy that we gave to the system initially in the form of heat, and that's why this periodic behavior dies away. So those provide the foundation for understanding RLC circuits. We'll come back to this many, many times uh, to understand how the mechanical analogy relates to the uh, electrical, electrical situation. Okay, so I'm going to start with uh, a simple LC circuit. So again, we're trying to uh, walk before we start running. We want to start with something as simple as possible. If I'm talking about RLC circuits, maybe I should consider just one L and one C first, see how they work, and then try to make it more complete. All right, so here's the situation. I start with a capacitor, we call it C1. And I place some initial condition on this capacitor. So we call it V0. OK? So we have stored electric energy on this capacitor in the electric field. And that is equivalent to giving potential energy to this pendulum. So right here. So I can imagine it's like this. All right? OK. Now. With the situation, with this condition that we have, we connect this capacitor to an inductor, L1. The inductor doesn't have any initial condition in it. And we let go. All right? So the capacitor has some charge, some voltage. The inductor doesn't have any current. We let go, and we'd like to see what happens. We can monitor the current that flows through this loop, or we can monitor this voltage. Either one is fine. Let's just monitor this voltage. Let's monitor this voltage and see what happens. So I would like to sketch this voltage as a function of time before I write equations for the circuit, right? OK, so here's the, how it goes. At time 0, V out is how much? It's V0, right? This value. So what, as soon as the circuit is let go, uh, the voltage on the capacitor is the same as the voltage on the inductor and is equal to V out. Can the voltage on the capacitor change from 0 minus to 0 plus? No, because to change the voltage on the capacitor instantaneously, I would need an infinite current. And there's no source here that could give me an infinite current, right? This inductor cannot provide an infinite current, right? So we can't change this voltage instantaneously. At 0 plus, we still have V0. All right, now the question is what happens after this point? I have a capacitor connected to an inductor. What does the inductor do? Well, the inductor provides a path for this charge to go from here to here, right? So again, uh, just keep in mind of this situation that we had, right? So we said this wire is a wire, but when you wind it, is an inductor, right? So, well, it still has a path for charge to flow through it, right? It flows through, it, the, the charge can go through this wire, go through this, and come out. So this charge can still go through this wire and come out. So the capacitor begins to discharge through the inductor. So the voltage on the capacitor begins to go down. All right, so let's do that. The voltage on the capacitor begins to go down in some form. We don't exactly know what shape it is. It's going to go down. So it's conceivable that the capacitor loses all of its charge, 
And at some point, its voltage goes to zero, right? This voltage is the same as this voltage. So we have reached zero. All right. So far, so good. The question is, does the circuit stop here? Or does it do something more interesting after this point? Well, uh, we always have to keep uh, the energy in mind. Initially, we had a certain amount of energy here, right? So right at this point, we said the uh, energy on cap is one half C V zero squared. Right, that's what we had. And now, at this point in time, the voltage on the capacitor has collapsed to zero. So there's no energy in the capacitor. So here, we say E cap is equal to zero. So then what happened? The energy cannot disappear, it has to go somewhere. So that energy presently, right here, resides in the inductor, right? There's no other place. We have only an inductor and a capacitor. So we say at this point in time, the energy in the inductor is equal to one half CV zero squared. The initial energy that we had stored on the capacitor, right, at this point in time. Remember, V0 is a constant value, right, the initial condition. So that is interesting. We have an inductor that has some energy in it. How can an inductor have energy in it? It has to have a current because we said that the energy in an inductor is given by one-half Li squared. So this has to be equal to one-half L1, so this is C1, C1, L1I squared, meaning that there is a finite, a non-zero current through the inductor at this point in time. That's inevitable. It has to be there so that there's energy in the inductor. Okay, so there's a current through the inductor at this point in time. So here's the situation. This voltage has collapsed to zero. This capacitor has nothing left but all the energy in the capacitor turned into magnetic energy into the inductor. The inductor now has all the current through it, and it has a magnetic field and magnetic energy. So our analogy is like this. We started here. We had potential energy in the system. That was the charge on the capacitor. Then we let go, and uh, it accelerated, and it arrived right at this point as it was traveling, right, right here. At this point, we don't have any potential energy anymore. And that's like here. We don't have any electric energy on the capacitor anymore. But we have kinetic energy, right? It's going like this. So what will happen? It has to continue in the opposite direction, just the way this pendulum continues, right? So the voltage on the capacitor and on the inductor goes in the opposite direction. OK? So. We will see why it has to go in the opposite direction. Why can, it, why can it not go back this way? But the best analogy is the pendulum, right? So we have potential, kinetic, and then we continue to reach the other extreme of potential, right? So it has to happen that way. So it will continue in the opposite direction. How far will it go? Well, as this voltage increases, the voltage on the capacitor is increasing, of course, in the opposite direction. How far can the voltage on the capacitor go? It can go only to the maximum value given by its energy, the energy available in the system. So this has to come down only to this level. This level will be minus V0. And at this point, the energy on the cap is 1 half C V squared, V0 squared, right? It's minus V0 squared, but it's V0 squared. This is the uh, maximum uh, absolute voltage that we can have on the capacitor because the energy available in the system cannot be more than this, right? If it goes uh, more negative, it goes to like minus, minus 2V0, that won't work because the energy will be higher than what we started out with at time zero. Okay, so if we reach here, how much is the current through the inductor? Well, the energy in the capacitor has reached its full amount that we started with, so the inductor has no energy, right? The inductor gave all its energy back to the capacitor. 
So we say E inductor is zero, which means I inductor is zero. All right? Okay, so again, our pendulum analogy helps, right? So we started from here, a complete potential energy we're over here, all electric field. Then we came here, it's all kinetic energy. So the current in the inductor has reached the maximum. The mag the, all the energy is in the magnetic field of the inductor. And then we continue in the opposite direction to get to the other extreme. And over here, again, we have just, kinetic, um, just potential energy. So we are over here, and we have the same energy as before, assuming that there's no loss in the system, assuming there's no friction at this hinge, there's no friction with the air. Okay, what happens after this point? Well, after this point, it's going to go up, and it's going to do, do this, and it will oscillate. That's interesting, isn't it? So our job is to quantify all of this behavior and see why this happens. I will see you next time.